Chapter 13 Dadaistic Chaotology Semantic Cynicisms Quoting Walter Zerner, Letzte Lockerung, from 1918 to 20. 1. Around a fireball races a doubt pallet of dung on which ladies' stockings are sold and Gauguin's valued. 78. A swift kick for the cosmos. Viva Dada. Quoting Raoul Hausmann's Der Deutsche Spießer Ehrgeizig. We have the right to every diversion, whether it be in words and forms, colours, sounds, but all this is a glorious bit of nonsense that we consciously love and prepare. A huge irony, like life itself, the exact technique of finally comprehended senselessness as the meaning of the world. Quoting Johannes Bader, Reklame für mich. Hindendorf, Ludenberg are not historical names. There is only one historical name, Bader. Quoting Richard Hoylsenbeck, Everything should live, but one thing must cease, the citizen. With Dada, the first neo kinicism of the 20th century strides on stage. Its thrust is directed against everything that takes itself seriously, whether it be in the area of culture and the arts, in politics or in public life. Nothing else in our century has so furiously smashed the esprit de sérieux as the Dadaist babble. Dada is basically neither an art movement nor an anti-art movement, but a radical philosophical action. It practices the art of a militant irony. From bourgeois institution art, quoting Peter Berger, Dada makes a claim only on that motif that had given the arts their philosophical momentum in the bourgeois century, that of the amoralist freedom of expression. But art had long since ceased to be what it had been at its centre and in its neo chemical founding phase, i.e. in the bourgeois Sturm und Drang of the 18th century, a medium of expression for the quote-unquote truth. What the Dadaists saw before them was an art of the aestheticist type. Aestheticistic type. What the Dadaists saw before them was an art of the aestheticistic type, an artist's art that took itself totally and ceremoniously seriously, a substitute religion and a means for beautifying the hideous bourgeois capitalist reality. The Dadaists, therefore, simply rehabilitated the philosophical impulse of the arts, their will to truth, in a counter-attack against its submersion by aesthetics, finesse, and elitist vanities. With an act of violence, they equated art with what at the time was called contemptuously arts and crafts. With that innocuous decorative art that accommodated the need of the upright citizen, Spisa, for being cheered up and for diversion from reality. For the supporters of the avant-garde, by contrast, reality smacked of the rawest neg negativity. And it could thus happen that the peaceful and anti-militarist Dada people of Zurich in 1916, almost without exception immigrants from warring countries, even reckoned the pacifists among their enemies, because they disgracefully unrealistic, merely counterposed an ideal of peace to reality. Here, the handwriting of clinical modernity appears for the first time. Affirmation of reality as reality, in order to be able to smash in the face of everything that is merely aesthetic thinking. A quote. The handicraft artisans from all of Zurich began a resolute campaign against us, that was the most beautiful thing. Now we knew whom we had to deal with. We were against the pacifists because the war had given us the possibility to exist at all in our entire glory. And at that time the pacifists were even more respectable than today, where every stupid kid wants to exploit the conjuncture with his books against the times. We were for the war, and today Dadaism is still for war, 
things have to collide. Things are not proceeding nearly as horribly as they should. End quote. Those were the words with which Richard Heusenbeck obliged his audience in his first Dada speech in Germany, Berlin, February 1918. Morally, we will probably never be able to come to terms with such a text. Psychologically, scarcely any better. We must first gain experience with ironical, polemical ways of speaking in order to comprehend Heusenbeck's way of proceeding. He was trying out the new tactics on an immeasurably ticklish subject, namely the art of declaring oneself, in an ironic, dirty way, to be in agreement with the worst possible things. With cynical speeches, he produced an ego beyond good and evil that wanted to be like its mad epoch. At that time, the war was still raging on all fronts. Western quote-unquote values were quote-unquote collapsing like the German Western Front at the time, and beyond that a whole age that will be called the bourgeois period, the aged 19th century. In the battles of matter of the World War, Europe experienced the quote-unquote return of the repressed, the return of the beast out of the false peace of an imperialist, respectable bourgeoisie. The bourgeois spirit of progress had been an irrealism, it had answered by what had been denied for all too long in fearful explosions. After Nietzsche, the Dadaists were the first who tried to take up the return of the repressed from a positive angle. In doing so, they gave the artistic right to uninhibited free expression a new twist. Between the mentality of the generals, who are respectably for war, and the mentality of the pacifists, who are respectably against it, the Dadaists erected a maliciously clashing third position, quote-unquote, free of all scruples, to be unrespectably for it. Dada draws a part of its driving force from the feeling of seeing the world in an indomitably sober way. One assumes a pathetic, positivistic air. One unrelentingly separates quote-unquote, naked facts from phrases, mere culture from hard reality. A quote from Hausmann, from Der Deutsche Speiser ergert, ergert sich. Der Deutsche Speiser ergert sich. We propagate no ethics, which always remain ideal, swindle, we want to arrange economy and sexuality rationally. We don't give a damn about culture, which was not a palpable thing. We want its demise. We want the world to be moved and movable. Turmoil instead of calm. Away with all chairs. To hell with feelings and noble gestures. End quote. In the Dadaist Manifesto we read, quote, The word Dada symbolizes the most primitive relation to the surrounding reality. With Dadaism, a new reality comes into its right. Life appears as a simultaneous whir of sounds, colours and spiritual rhythms that is taken over into Dadaist art together with all sensational screams and fevers, its audacious everyday psyche and its entire brutal reality. End quote. In Dadaism, individuals consciously execute for the first time the inversion of the modern ego-world relationship characteristic of all modern subjectivity. Cynical individuals put an end to the pose of the self-sufficient creative artist, genius, the world-thinker, philosopher, the expansive entrepreneur. Rather, they consciously let themselves be driven along by what is given. If what drives us is brutal, then so are we. Dada does not look into an ordered cosmos. What is important for it is presence of mind and in the chaos. In the middle of the murderous tumult, every pose of a great thinker, as was usual in the calmly excited Laban's philosophy of the time, would have been senseless. Dada demanded from existence, design, an absolute simultaneity with the tendencies of its own time existential avant-garde. Only what was most advanced lived with Dada on one timeline. War as mobilization and self-disinhibition. 
the most advanced destructive procedures, even into the arts, anti-psychology, anti-bourgeoisie. It is the pathos of truth in this current, to have the times in one's nerves and to think and to live in their rhythm. We can hear a philosophical echo here, namely, Dada anticipates motifs of Heidegger's existential ontology, which, for its part, criticises the lie of the subject in the European philosophy of domination on the highest conceptual plane. The ego is not the master of the world, but lives in it under the sign of thrownness, Gewürfenheit. We make at most projections, Entwürfe, but these too are in turn projected projects, Gewürfener Entwürfe, so that primarily a passive structure towards being holds true. Next door we hear, quoted from Dada Istisches Manifest, a leaflet from 1918. To be a Dadaist means to let oneself be thrown by things, to be against every formation of a sediment. To have sat for a moment on the chair means to have brought life into danger. The idea could occur to us that existential ontology is an academic catching up to Dada philosophy or Dadaology whereby Martin Heidegger would have contested the status of head Dada held by the master Johannes Bader with enormous success. The secret of Heidegger's success touches the point that constitutes the failure of Dada, respectability. Instead of the unrespectably glittering productions of Dadaist projected artists of life and politicking satyrs, projectedness in its respectable variant won out. The Dada attack has both a cynical and cynical aspect. The atmosphere of the first is playful and productive, childish and childlike, wise, generous, ironical, sovereign, unassailably realistic. The second aspect reveals strong destructive tensions, hate and haughty defensive reactions against the internalised fetish of the citizen, considerable projection, and a dynamic of affects of contempt and disappointment, self-hardening and loss of irony. It is not easy to separate these two aspects. They make the Dada phenomenon as a whole into a scintillating complex that evades simple evaluations and uncomplicated emotional responses. Dada also behaves ambiguously toward fascism. With its cynical elements, Dada belongs definitely to anti-fascism and to the logic and aesthetic of resistance. With its cynical elements, by contrast, it leans towards the pre-fascist aesthetics of annihilation that wants to enjoy the intoxication of demolition to the full. Dada tends to struggle against the bloody earnestness which, however, with its aggressive aspects, lies deep within Dada itself. The Dadaists by no means succeeded in treating their own motives ironically. In their ironic poses, much unfree destructiveness remained stuck, and in their way of letting themselves go, a lot of resistance and self-hardening could be demonstrated. Dada Sophie develops here and there, mystically ironic visions that celebrate life in its undivided fullness. But these are despairingly exaggerated in tone, as in the proclamation of the chief Dada, Johannes Bader. Quote, A Dadaist is someone who loves life in all its limitless shapes and who knows and says, not only here but also there, 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 da, 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 is life. The genuine Dadaist thus also masters the whole register of human expressions of life, starting with grotesque self-persiflage up to the most holy word of the church service on the ball called Earth, which has become mature and which belongs to all people. End quote. Even in such megalomaniac hymns of the sect's chieftain, Bader, who proclaimed himself president of the universe, the typical attempts of a more encompassing affirmation appear, in which Dada irony fits well with the cynical aspect of religion. 
See the works on mysticism by Dadaists, especially Hugo Ball. In Dadaism, a, prov a provisional philosophy of yes is attempted that refers, above all, to the concrete, momentary, droll and creative energy of the Dada individual. The yes holds for the state of the world, which it treats ironically, but even more for the lived moment in which the miracle of an eternal, fleeting present and the existentialist paradox of the inner duration, simultaneously permeated and untouched by the turbulence in the world, are realised. The cultural superstructure must be annihilated so that this vital dynamic element can step into the foreground. The Dadaists thus often see, even in Expressionism, only the continuation of German idealism. Quote, nauseous mystification of things called Expressionism, end quote. The first Expressionist, a person who invented, quote unquote, inner freedom, was a, ah, <coughs> excuse me, this is another quote from Hausmann, Rückkehr zur Gegenständlichkeit in der Kunst. The first expressionist, a person who invented inner freedom, was a gluttonous and sodden Saxon, Martin Luther. He affected the protesting turn of the German to an inexplicable inwardness and amounting to mendacity, a juggling with imagined sufferings, abyss of the soul and its power beside a servile malleability toward official power. He is the father of Kant. Schopenhauer in today's idiocy and art, and stares past the world and thereby thinks it has overcome it. End quote. Nietzsche's cynical realism echoes here, with the same anti Protestant component of hate. The Dadaist yes to reality and to realization does not concern itself with the opinions of experts, connoisseurs, snobs and critics. One may understand Dadaism as a prelude to an emancipation of dilettantes that assumes that the joy in creating is more important than the successful result. Ability is only embellishment of genuineness. It, pardon me. It is not the lasting works that count, but the moment of their intensive realisation. A further Nietzschean motif the recurrence of the same can be found in Dadaosophy. In a brilliant sketch called It Was Done by Dada, a trialogue between human beings, broad historical dimensions are skimmed through. Quote from pages 110 to 13. There has always been Dada. In old Egypt, as much as in Europe or Mexico, the Dadaist, my dear Dr. Smartney, is independent of time. It is continually reborn. It is handed down through the chain of generations. Dada is an eminently metaphysical matter. Dada is the great scrutinizer and catcher of moralists. You regard it as the religious worldview of an ancient Egyptian sect, but Dada also appeared in India. The Shivites of the left hand cultivated it. In the Gilgamesh epic of the old Assyrians, you will find references that Dada is identical with the birth of the world. In the Dionysus mysteries, Dada is to be found just as much as in the oracular sayings of the priests of Dodona. Dada is the greatest irony. It appears it is a tendency, but is no tendency. The sexual criminal Alton was a Dadaist when he wrote in his diary, Killed a young girl today. It was fine and hot. Manalesu was a Dadaist when he appeared as a prince and took lodgings in the emperor's court without knowing how he would pay the bill. Dada is the American side of Buddhism. Dadaist documents are always forged. End quote. That Dadaist thinking cannot be summarised and reduced to a formula lies in its structure based on instantaneity. It moves entirely within processes, leaps, points that in their very essence cannot be abbreviated. The thing itself is its execution, a theme that, by the way, dominates reflection philosophy, particularly in Fichte and Hegel. To talk, quote-unquote, 
about Dada consciousness means almost automatically to place oneself beneath its plane. If we nevertheless try to say something general about it, we do this with the express remark that the object is not the Dada documents, but the Dada method. I want to call it a procedure of reflected negation. In other words, a technique of disordering meaning, a nonsense procedure. Wherever firm quote unquote values, higher meanings and deeper significance emerge, Dada attempts a disordering of meaning. Dada provides an explicit technique in the disappointment of meaning, and thereby stands in a broader spectrum of semantic cynicisms with which the demythologization of the world and of metaphysical consciousness reaches a radical final stage. Dadaism and logical positivism are parts of a process that pulls the ground out from under all faith in universal concepts, formulas for the world and totalizations. They both work like a garbage disposal in the depraved European superstructure of ideas. The Dadaists, indeed, were all descended from a generation that a short time before still had genuflected with insuperable awe before everything called art, work of art, culture, and genius. For them, the first task was a grand cleaning up in one's own head, of one's own past. They negate, as apostates of an earlier faith in art, their previous way of living, and the tradition in which they can no longer stand bestowing meaning through art and the elevation of the ordinary to the significant. In the backlash against this declining way of living, Dada finds acidic words, particularly with regards to the quote-unquote last tendency in art, expressionism. Another quote from Hausmann's Der Deutsche Spieße Ehrgeizig. No, gentlemen, art is not in danger, for art no longer exists. It is dead. It was the development of all things. It still enveloped the bulbous nose and the swinish lips of Sebastian Müller with beauty. It was a beautiful illusion, proceeding from a sunny, serene feeling toward life. And now nothing elevates us any longer, nothing at all. The absolute incapability. This is expressionism. The writing or painting petty bourgeois could regard himself as solidly sacred. He finally grew somehow beyond himself into an indeterminate, universal world. Drowsiness. No oh, expressionism. You turning point in the world of romantic falsehood. End quote. It is no accident that this posture that storms against art had its day once more around 1968 when the Dada of the New Left was quote-unquote reborn in activism. Happenings, go-ins, love-ins, shit-ins, all the body Dadaisms of a renovated clinical consciousness. Dada does not revolt against bourgeois institution art. Dada turns against art as a technique of bestowing meaning. Dada is anti-semantics. It rejects quote-unquote style as pretense of meaning, just as much as the deceitful, quote-unquote, beautifying of things. As anti-semantics, Dadaism systematically disrupts, not metaphysics, but the talk about it. The metaphysical domain is laid bare as a festival ground. There everything is allowed, except opinions. The, quote-unquote, irony of life, quoting Hausmann, is supposed to be captured by Dadaist irony, even Dadaism as style would already be a step backward. And precisely in this sense, art history has appropriated it and ordered it into the museum of stylistic schools. Foreseeing this, Hausmann said he is actually speaking as anti-Dadaist, because Dada is a procedure. It cannot, quote, sit on a chair, unquote. Every style is a chair. In this sense, Dada understands itself even as an exact technique. It says, no, methodically and without fail. When a meaning of the world emerges that does not concede that it is nonsense, all opining, every idealization is sublated in intellectual movement, 
montage and demontage, improvisation and revocation. The sharpest honing was given to Dadaist semantic cynicism by Walter Serner, the writer whom Lessing called a German Maupassant. The fact that he had been rediscovered in our day shows that in West Germany too, a public has been formed in which the sense for cynicism has grown, and that can read this author because, in his polished immoralism, a sense for highly conscious, highly conscious, quote, unfortunately necessary, end quote, malice, all too well understandable today, betrays itself. Forty pages of incomparable prose, let's de Lockerung, the final slackening, originate from Cerner, written in the last year of the First World War, published in 1920 by Paul Stegemann in Hanover in his collection Die Silbergeule, The Silver Nags, a series of philosophical poetic miniatures composed of cultural critique and cyanide. Nowhere else can the meaning of sublation, Aufhebung, be studied with such sharpness, a violent and simultaneously playful bursting of all cultural semantics, of positing meaning, philosophies and exercises in art. Brutally and elegantly, this prose strikes out on all sides. Cerner presents a theory of language games besides which Wittgenstein's theory looks like finger exercises for respectable PhD candidates. Quoting Habeli Tenton, page 4. In this, quote-unquote, slackening, the disinhibition of a certain suicidal tendency also portrays itself. Intellectual aggressivity is directed not only outwardly, and brings about not only a spectacular, repulsive reaction by civilization critique. Cerner, the most reflective of the Dadaists, provided himself with an account of the fact that the Dadaist hatred of culture is logically directed inwardly against the culture in me I once quote unquote possessed, and that now is good for nothing. Quoting page eight Favorable proposal. Before going to sleep, one imagines, with the most pronounced clarity, the final stage of a suicide who, by means of the bullet, wants to finally weld self-consciousness into himself. End quote. Where no content counts anymore, only a moment of desperate intensity remains. A suicide's self-consciousness that is through with everything. Existence as being unto death. After this, there is no longer any question that Dadaism and Heideggerian existential ontology nurture a subterranean community of inspiration with each other. At the zero point of meaning, only a pathetic contempt for meaning still stirs itself, an all-penetrating nausea about positivity. Quoting page 5, Walten Schauungen are word mixtures. End quote. In true positivist manner, Cerner looks into his head and finds there words and sentences that afford no connection. He projects this disconnection, this disconnectedness onto the world, which accordingly can no longer be a cosmos. Dadaist anti-semantics proceeds consistently to an anti-cosmology. From now on it keeps a sharp eye on people as they paste together worldviews and conceptions of order. In the beginning was the chaos into which people, in their debility and hunger for meaning, dream a cosmos. Quoting pages 5 to 6. Set a redeeming heaven down on top of this chaos of smut and riddle. Sent human dung with order, I think. Therefore, philosophies and novels are sweated over, pictures smeared down, sculptures tinkered with, symphonies etched out and religion started. What a shattering ambition, especially because these vain donkey tricks have all thoroughly, particularly in German regions, missed the mark. It's all boulder dash. End quote. 
Here, one of the naiveties of the older positivism comes to light, namely that it conceives of the world as a confusion of quote-unquote facts that whirl about each other, just like the sentences in the heads of the logical positivists. However, in contrast to Cerner, who tries to outdo the unbearable through affirmation, they cannot bear this chaos of uncoordinated sentences. Therefore, they put formal, logical corsets on their facts. In their approach, they are all chaotologists. They all assume the precedence of the unordered, the hypercomplex, the meaningless, and that which demands too much of us. Cynical semantics, up to Luhmann, can do nothing other than to charge order to the account of cultural caprice, or the coercion toward a system. With Cerner, we see how the otherwise playful Dada Sophie turns into a humorless, cold romantics. It is a romantics of utter unnaivety. In it, the anxiety of being taken by surprise by a naive gesture or a surrender is at work. That drives malevolent reflection into its own hardened flesh. No search for a better life is counterposed to the universal unhappiness. Rather, the attempt is made to counter the given unhappiness with self-intended high misery, like a sovereign trump card. This is the way a consciousness behaves that is not only despairing, but also elevates the wish to be hard as the point of departure for its self-remodelling. In his unholy self-reflection, Cerner practices the art of piling up and outdoing every positive thought with objections, detachments and condescending commentaries in a distrustful, furious manner. Self-experience and self-destruction become one and the same. Everything is rage that, to be sure, expresses itself, but does not discharge itself in a liberating way. Quoting page 42. Rage is thus life itself? Oh, to be sure, rage contains most of all uprightness. To be sure. All other states can only be suffered in that the rage remains hidden, or in that the rage dissimulates. However, senselessness, at its highest point, is rage, 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 and is far from being meaning. End point. In this sense, a subterranean line leads through the culture of hatred in our century, from Dada to the punk movement, and the necrophilic robot gestics of New Wave. Here, a mannerism of rage makes itself felt that gives the great dead ego a pedestal from which the nauseous, incomprehensible world can be despised. It is urgent that these reflective spaces of modern, unhappy consciousness be described, because they are the spaces in which the phenomenon of fascism too, insofar as it is militant nihilism, consolidates. Even in the obvious stupidity of Nazi ideology, a certain quote-unquote artful dimension was hidden in the structure. Insofar as Dada presented a cynical show, it led a struggle of unhappy consciousness for sovereignty, in spite of the feeling of meaninglessness for grand poses, in spite of inner hollowness. Semantic cynicism is accompanied not only by suicidal inclinations, but also by the risk of historical reaction that can be demonstrated through the paradoxical sensuousness of fascism, which brought a resurrection of grand meaning in the political spectacle that covered up the long-felt nothingness. In the hysteria, a will to break through the self-controls of the lifeless everyday ego expresses itself. The hysteria is driven, according to Lacan's malicious aphorism, by the search for a master to tyrannise. To the extent that a spark of political hysteria was effective in Dadaism, this hysteria still had a strong realist component. For the master Dada sought in order to beat him up, for the Master Dada sought, in order to beat him up, also existed, outside Dada consciousness and reality. And as warlord in this imperialist bourgeois world war, he was objectively worse than any hoax, no matter how malicious. Fascist hysteria, by contrast, even invented the master it wanted to tyrannise. 
and itself conjured up a Jewish world conspiracy in order to eradicate a people whose existence was, to be sure, no mere figment of the imagination. Cerner's final slackening thus remained a penultimate slackening. As far as we know, his whole life long, he did not let the mask of the gentleman fall. True, he saw the world as having, quote-unquote, gone to the dogs, but he himself shrank back from, quote-unquote, going before the dogs, quoting Kessner. Even his sophisticated dog-eat-dog crime stories maintain a style that has more of the master in it than the dog. The Dardosopha, Dada Osopha, the Dada Sopha, Raoul Hausmann, kept closer to the secret of the cynical pleasure in disputation, which can attack without falling into self-destruction. He consciously oriented himself towards the sounder forms of symbolic destructiveness, towards the, quote, alertness of laughter, irony, and the useless, end quote. Towards the, quoting from page 50, jubilation of Orphic nonsense. Orphic in the sense of um, orphism, not orphans. So, reader's note there. That is the way Diogenes' dogs bark. Quoting from Subliteral, 1919, page 53. This damned Christ said, see the lilies in the field. I say, see the dogs in the street. End quote. Excursus 1. Bluff Twilight. Quoting Kurt Tucholsky. Dada. 20th of July 1920. I know exactly what the people want. The world is motley, senseless, pretentious and intellectually inflated. They want to despise, show up, deny, destroy that. One can surely talk about that. Those who hate fervently must have once loved deeply. Those who want to deny the world must have embraced what they now set on fire. End quote. In Tucholsky, the Dadaists found their first apparently well-meaning psychologist. He tried, as popular explicator, to extract the good contained in the bad in order to simultaneously justify and belittle it. Tucholsky translates the Dadaist dissolution back into a serious language. He calls this understanding, these people. They are, like all of us, those who have been disappointed by the bad world who only let off steam more forcefully than our kind. The Berlin Dada phenomena being spoken about here are interpreted by Tucholsky as symptoms of a great loss of love through which, yes, had been turned into no, and love into hate. Through the explanation of its psychic mechanism, the matter seems to have been brought into order again, if the negative is really only the inversion of the positive, we must know this, and then we can surely talk about it. In this way, the psychologizing journalist determines how negativity is to be dealt with. To be sure, he himself knows irony all too well, but his way of lessening the gravity of things is through melancholy. He does not really consider an aggressive irony. It thus must happen that with his understanding... He pensively belittles the thing to be explained. Quote from page 125. When we subtract what is bluff in this association, not a terrible lot remains. End quote. But who said that we should subtract the bluff? With this formula, Tucholsky gets caught in his respectable misunderstanding. For the Dada procedure, bluff is indeed fundamental. Bluff and Bewilderment, Verblüffung, belong together and produce a provocative wake-up effect. Dada builds in a certain way on a bluff realism and demonstrates a technique of deception, Täuschung, exposure, Enttäuschung, and self-exposure, Selbstentäuschung. As a methodology of bluff, of pretense and disruption of meaning, Dada shows ironically how modern ideology functions. 
to establish values and act as if one believed in them, and then to show that one has not the slightest intention of believing in them. With this self-dissolution, selbst aufhebung, of Weltanschauung, world uh, word mixture, Dada betrays the modus operandi of modern consciousness with all its notorious meaning swindles. Tucholsky cannot, or rather does not want, to see this. He himself still postulates objective, quote-unquote, meaning. For this reason, he does not come up to the level of the object he wanted to explain. He does not see that the methods of advertising, political propaganda, activist and neoconservative Weltanschauung of the hit parade and entertainment industry, etc., etc., have here been laid out like a toolbox, or better, like a grammar before our understanding. For Dada contains a bluff theory in action. Without a theory of bluff, of show, seduction and deception, modern structures of consciousness cannot be explained at all properly. It may give cause for reflection that Tucholsky, up to just before the seizure of power, views the ascendant Nazism still from the viewpoint of respectable irony, and is full of contempt for the stupidity, crampedness, bluff, posing, big-mouthedness, etc. of the Nazis. To the last, this remains the tenor of Tucholsky's anti-fascist fouetons that otherwise leave nothing to be desired regarding sharpness. But the sharpness of real understanding is missing. Like all other defenders of melancholy seriousness, he is unable to develop a penetrant relation to quote-unquote reflexive ideology and to the phenomena of bluff and disingenuous opinion. In this regard, he was completely different from Brecht, who from the ground up was in position to think in the opponent's thought forms, to tack, to weave, to let oneself go, and at the same time, to control oneself. Tucholsky's public moralism is expressed most clearly in his notes on the Dada trial before the Second District Court in Berlin in 1921. At that time, the case before the court concerned a plea by members of the army, Reichswehr, against George Gross's drawings, quote, God is with us, in which grimacing faces of soldiers, of unheard of brutality were to be seen, end quote, from Dada, page 127. The five accused, Bader, Gross, Hetzfelder, Schlichter, and Burkhardt, the gallery owner, disappointed the expectations of the left-wing trial observers. Instead of confessing, they tried to get off by belittling themselves. Same book, pages 128 to 29. Five living beings on the bench for the accused, among them one man, Wieland, Hertzfelder. He was the only one who was said to hear what was necessary and did not shrink back. None of the boys was the one who had smashed the window pane, as far as Groats is concerned. I do not know whether the laxity of his defence can be traced to the fact that he cannot speak. His plea saved Groats's neck and was annihilating for him and his friends. Quote, so that's your defence. Did you intend it to be so? End quote. End, end quote. Is Tuchulski here not following an outmoded moral psychology? Consistency right up to jail and full-blooded political character? More identity, more confession, longer sentences. Does he not see that the ruling ideology wants precisely the same thing? Namely to isolate culprits with political persuasions? Does the man of conviction not have an advertising function for the political opponent? In any case, it remains remarkable that Tchaikovsky's demand for character related to people who were just more or less in the process of consciously developing an ironic strategy. Instead of profiting from the new art of sublation, Tchaikovsky relied on melancholic lethargy. Here, he missed an experience that would have saved him from certain surprises in 1933. Those who treat phenomena of bluff as something one should quote-unquote disregard must remain blind to fascism, even if in other ways they are the bravest anti-fascists in the world. 
Klaus Mann grasped the problematic of bluff from a somewhat clearer perspective, but he too sees the matter somewhat defensively. Quoting, Heimsuchung des Europäischen Geistes. Essays, Munich, 1973, page 49. We want to distinguish ourselves from the Nazis, for whom everything, from their quote-unquote nationalism up to their quote-unquote socialism, is mere tactics, that is, bluff, trick, and swindle. Above all, through the fact that we are serious about what we say, that we really mean the words and ideas with which we are trying to support for our cause. That we really mean the words and ideas with which we try to draw support for our cause. End quote. Klaus Mann was one of the first to view the cynical component of fascist ideology clearly. Quote-unquote ideology. He developed nothing less than the relatedness of the actor with the fascist politician out of the spirit of bluff. See the novel Mephisto. However, he remains questionable whether he, for his part, can really be serious about the antithesis to it. Quote, to mean it seriously, end quote. What is an anti-fashionism and an anti-nihilism that itself is essentially based on the fact that one, more sure than one can be, erects opposed values and behaves respectably, only so as not to be cynical like the others? Is anti-nihilism itself not simply an obstructed nihilism? Gross, who had worked off the hate within himself in his early work, much later described the connection between nihilism and commitment as anti-nihilism, as follows. Quote from page 155, uh, sorry, 115. We demanded more. We do not quite know how to say what that more was, but many of my friends and I did not find any solution in the merely negative, in the rage at having been deceived and in the denial of all previous values. And so we were driven as a matter of course more and more to the left. Soon I was head over heels in political currents. I gave speeches, not because of some conviction or other, but because everywhere at any hour people hung around disputing, and because I had not yet learned anything from my experiences. My speeches were a stupid, parroted enlightenment babble. But when it dripped out of my mouth like honey, you could pretend that you were deeply moved. And often your own twaddle really moved you. Purely through the noise, sishing, twittering, the bellowing that came out of you. End quote. Another quote, Gross, ein kleines Jahr und ein großes Nein. Hamburg, 1974, page 111. I never went along with the idolization of the masses, not even in those times when I still pretended to believe in certain political theories. End quote. It must be said, however, that this is a different Gross talking, a Gross who, in exile in America, has sat down, inwardly and outwardly, in Dadaist language, quote, on the chair, unquote. What remains significant about this testimony is that it originates from someone who ran the entire gamut of negativism, political commitment and withdrawal, and could document it as a survivor. When Gross wrote his memoirs, the two critics of Bluff, Tucholsky and Mann, long since killed themselves. Excursus 2 The Ice Dogs On the Psychoanalysis of the Cynic Quoting Ernst Toller Hoopla! Wir leben! Hey, we're alive. 1927. In everyone the ice dogs bark. A thought-provoking coincidence. When Nazism came to power on January the 30th, 1933, the January-February issue of the journal Psychoanalytische Bewegung, Psychoanalytic Movement, appeared in which for the first time, pardon me, a pupil of Freud's addressed extensively the phenomenon of cynicism. Edmund Burgler, zur Psychoanalyse des Zynikers, Zynikers, Eins, 
the second part followed in the next issue. Next to this remarkable temporal constellation, another rather piquant observation is to be noted. Here, an author has something to say about a topic that stands in a thoroughly explosive relation to his profession. For the psychoanalyst, who expresses views on cynicism, talks about a topic that corresponds intimately with psychoanalysis. In 1933, an analyst could actually have found himself exposed to the charge of reinforcing a pornographic and cynical picture of humanity, two expressions that could easily be fused with the epithet, quote-unquote, Jewish, in a fatal way. Here, then, a psychologist has ventured into the lion's den. He tries to put the cynicism of analysis out of action through an analysis of cynicism. At one point, Burglar himself even betrays a powerful cynical bite, precisely when he defends himself against the charge that psychoanalysis, with its exposure of psychic mechanisms, could be suspected of cynicism. Psychoanalysis is nonetheless, he notes, a respectable science, and science is no life insurance for illusions. Quoting from page 141. For the rest, Burglar's interest centres on personalities in whom cynical tendencies are striking. As his depth psychological studies of Napoleon, Talleyrand, Graber, and others demonstrate. It is obvious his reflections are motivated by current events, as shown not least of all by the fact, as examples, he brings in texts and events of the most recent times. For example, Eric Kessner's novel Fabian from 1931. Finally, Burglar's study reveals, with the use of some examples, that he believes he has found traits of cynicism in some patients that, as a rule, manifest themselves in the form of aggressions against him, the analyst. To that extent, we are justified in saying that this psychoanalytic statement on cynicism arose in a thick mesh of current motives and stimuli that tie the text precisely to the historical moment, 1932-33, and to the author's professional situation. He defends his profession against the charge of cynicism, he diagnoses some patients who attack him as having traits of cynicism, quote-unquote moral insanity. There is thus no question that here we are in the middle of things, even when they are spoken about matter-of-factly. What strikes us is the extraordinary emphasis with which the analyst proclaims cynicism, or better, the cynical mechanisms, to be a manifestation of the unconscious and of the persisting infantile component in the adult. With a grand gesture, the whole domain of cynical phenomena is pocketed for psychoanalysis. Burglar allows only four of the 64 listed forms and variants of cynicism to count as conscious, and even behind these, insofar as they are not disqualified from the beginning as shallow and worthless, he conjectures that there are grave neuroses. Cynicism, says Burglar, is one of the forms in which people with extremely strong emotional ambivalences hate, love, respect, contempt, etc., create a psychic possibility for discharge. Cynical, quote-unquote, discharge, accordingly stands on the same level as classic neurotic mechanisms, such as the historical, hysterical, melancholic, compulsive, paranoid, and criminal defences. In cynicism, the negative, aggressive side of the ambivalence can be expressed. However, this side alone does not characterise quote-unquote cynical discharge. In addition, an extremely strong quote, unconscious need to be punished unquote, must be present. Masochistic and exhibitionist tendencies, although male verbal cynics are often said to be strikingly prone to shame regarding their bodies. In cynical speech, a psychodynamic related to the compulsion to confess, like, is said to be at work. To know what, to know that one violates the commandments of the strict superego, but that one cannot refrain from the infringements, and so to settle the inner conflict thus created, one resorts to truth that is now aggressively revealed. The cynic attacks the outer world in trying to become, trying to overcome an inner conflict. Quoting page 36, he beats the others. He wants to beat his conscience. But through its aggressive, comical side, 
cynicism was also a method of gaining pleasure, and this in a sevenfold way. One, because cynics become temporarily free of guilt by means of an apposite remark. Two, because the rage of others amuses them. This thesis is reflected in the blurb from J. Drew's Zinnisch's Wörterbuch, Zurich, 1978. Three, because they can enjoy their own exhibitionist tendencies. Exhibitionistic tendencies. Four, because cynicism is a method of distancing. Five, because narcissistic pleasure can occur insofar as clever statements are admired. Six, because jokes are simply funny. Seven, last of all, because thereby cynics can live out their infantile tendencies, by which I meant early infantile fantasies of grandeur, anal tendencies, and early sexual cynical rage against the whore and the mother, said more generally the scars of old Oedipus conflicts. The crux of this interpretation of cynicism is the older psychoanalytic superego theory that sees the human being as a creature that continually cowers under the commands and threats of a lofty, strict, quote-unquote, heavenly superego. However, it is curious that the analyst who deals with the cultural relativity of the so-called superego, which is expressed in cynicism, does not venture to think through this concept of the superego, as if his intellect cowered and crouched under the authority of the superfather, Freud. This is curious because Burglar comments on phenomena in which obviously the superego does not succeed in confirming oneself in the cynic's behaviour. Should the superego too not be something more than it once was? It seems that Burglar begins against his will to give an account of this. Cynicism is after all a phenomenon that belongs to the quote-unquote dialectic of culture and insofar as psychoanalysis as a theory of psychic processes is inevitably a theory of culture. In the long run, it cannot pretend that cultural phenomena, such as cynicism, can be treated merely psychodynamically. In fact, this is precisely the topic through which psychoanalysis sublates itself. The individual psyche has to be grasped just as much from the cultural aspect as the latter has to be grasped from the psychic aspect. The universal transtemporal, strict superego is a superseded analytic fiction. In most of Burglar's examples, there are some very nice ones among them and they alone make the reading rewarding, we can say that the mechanisms of the cynic statements were hidden to them only if we do violence to these examples. They know what they say and they say it not so much on the basis of unconscious mechanisms but because they have become conscious of real contradictions. Thus they... Pardon me. Thus they often express a contradiction cynically, or they express one of the many forms of mauvais foi cynically. The unconscious scarcely has to make an effort. The conscious participation of the ego is objective immoralisms and the obvious fragmentation of morals explain the matter much more effectively than does the depth of psychological theory. Only at one point does the analyst widen his field of view. Quoting from page 166. The flooding of the entire culture with fear of one's conscience, Gewissensangst, leads to the circumstance that even there, where persons seek to rid themselves of the fetters, in thought, as in cynicism, nothing other than a compromise with the superego comes about. One is thus not very far removed from reality when one says that cynicisms are all profoundly also a bowing before the superego, and compromises with the inner voice of conscience. Quote, not all those are free who mock their chains, end quote, taught a poet philosopher, but that even in his mockery people may pay tribute to the superego is grotesque, but that even in this mockery people pay tribute to the superego is grotesque, end quote. It cannot be better said, quote, one is thus not very far removed from reality, end quote, but still pretty far away. Burglar understands that many forms of cynicism are efforts to strip fetters. Consequently, that cynicism belongs to the dynamic of cultural liberation struggles and the social dialectic of values, 
in that it is one of the most important methods of working through ambivalences in a culture. The expression compromise indeed hints in this direction, with something that stood above me. No compromises could be concluded. Then it would just be a matter of obeying. The compromise is concluded with an authority that has no penetrating imperative force. Yeah, imperative force. With a weak superego and a conscience that only pricks but can no longer give orders. Burglar shows involuntarily that analysts and cynics are in the way the last real moralists. They let themselves be reminded now and again of the commandments of conscience and morality, even if only when a conflict arises between reality and morality. But the rest of, for the rest of the world, morality is always and everywhere not broken with such matter-of-factness, but split, so that one no longer even feels the quote-unquote inner conflict with it. With its theory of the superego, psychoanalysis gave the moralists of the last days a medium in which they can express themselves. However, the collective decomposition of the superego is always a step further along than the moralists think. Objective cynicism has a head start on subjective cynicism, which can never be made good. When cynics make malicious jokes, when they give morality the cold shoulder, when they demonstrate an icy coldness with which they anaesthetise themselves against the amoralism of the world, indeed when they even want to outdo its amoralism, then the subject of coldness towards morality reflects a general social freezing over. The joke that comes out of the cold at least reminds us in its aggressivity of a more vital living. The ice dogs still have the energy to bark and still possess enough bite to want to make things clear. Psychoanalysis, which is, quote, precisely not life insurance for illusions, end quote, also has it in its better half. The scientific embalming cannot erase the fact that enlightenment, as Kant and many others emphasised, is just as much, if not more, a matter of courage as of intellect, and that those who want to say the truth will not be able to avoid conflicts. The date is January 1933. Psychoanalysis reflects on cynicism. Soon it will have to emigrate. It is done with the analytic explanation of cynicism. It becomes evident that what was supposed to have been the solution has been overwhelmed by the problem.